up in the morning to you, ladies? My name is Jack Septicoid. How's it going, bros? My name is Perry Pat. Hello, everybody. My name is Markiplier, and welcome to Five Nights at Freddy's. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of Vivo music channels and network television shows, YouTube gaming has exploded and is arguably the biggest facet of traditional YouTube channels. Some might even say that they are currently the most popular videos being posted on YouTube today. But there's a section of these YouTubers that some believe have influence on the gaming industry. Speedrunners. Uh, oops, not, not the game called Speedrunners. Ah, oh, there we are. YouTube Speedrunners. And what do they do exactly? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines a speedrun as an instance of completing a video game or level of a game as fast as possible. They learn the ins and outs of the game and then I learn from them how it is I can improve my gameplay. The question I usually get when watching YouTube gaming is, why are you watching this when you could just be playing the game for yourself? To which I answer, one, I don't have the money for that. Or two, because I find it entertaining and this guy I'm watching is really good. I think more people like us than hate us. I would hope so. I think, I think so. Who knows? Uh, I feel like not enough people know about us to hate us, so maybe we can find more people to hate us, and hopefully more to like us, too. But when I do have the money to purchase the game, it's usually from seeing speedrunners that makes me want to have my own experience personally playing these games, sometimes with friends who will also buy the game. Some audiences also come back because they want to enjoy a game they played again, but don't have the means to do so. They even get to see some masterful gameplay along the way. And how do we know they are masterful players? For one, like I stated in the beginning, YouTube gaming is huge. Just look at the subscriber counts of some of these people. And two, they play and beat some of the most difficult video games out there, usually from having played the game multiple times already. That's why they upload footage to YouTube and show off their speedrunning prowess. Like when Game Grumps beat Ninja Gaiden, voted on Den of Geek as the third hardest game of all time. This is a huge game of our childhoods. Oh man, I played the shit out of this. Never beat it as a child. No one did. But I beat it recently. And I'm pretty good at this game. Yeah, uh, you are. You're Tearing it up. No, I'm not. I got hit three times, dude. It's like a super unfair game. Yes, that is true. I mean, that's its biggest problem, because, I mean, I know I played it for thousands of hours and I never beat it as a kid. Yeah! Oh, 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 God! Oh, oh, I did it! Oh, my God! You I can't believe I'm beating Ninja Guy! Oh, my God! There are mainly three subgroups of speed runs known as low percent, minimalist or finish, 100%, a completion, and any percent, fastest or time run. There are also game specific speed runs, such as playing through a game of Pokemon using only the basic Pokeballs for capturing. To help better explain these three subgroups though, and what each can show the audience, we're going to look into what many believe is one of the greatest video games of all time, Shigeru Miyamoto's The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. A low percent entails the player to beat the game as it was intended by getting everything you need to go through the game properly by earning the items required to move to the next level. Some may call this the casual gamer's method. In Ocarina of Time, you have to beat all the bosses as intended, but you won't necessarily need to collect all the items along the way. A 100% requires that you do everything. Get all the items, unlock all the paths, visit every location so it's on the map, do all the side quests. In Ocarina of Time, you should have beaten every boss, learned all 13 songs, retrieved all four bottles, have max capacity on certain items, collect all 100 gold skulltolas, and a bunch of other things that require hours and hours of playtime. And an any percent playthrough has very few restrictions as to how the game can be played, similar to a low percent in a way, but much, much quicker, and can include sequence breaking glitches and needing very few of the items necessary. In Ocarina of Time, this makes it possible to skip most of the game entirely and beat the final boss in less than 18 minutes of total game time. The world record holder who goes by Torhei on YouTube was done by glitching a dungeon compass to appear in his bag as a bottle filled with water you can't get until entering other towns, putting a spider into said bottle after beating the dungeon boss, glitching so it makes the character's running movements faster and backwards, dropping the spider in an out of player boundary doorway back in the first dungeon boss room and recollecting it causing the player to technically go out of bounds, backflipping into the teleportation circle that doesn't end up teleporting him out of the level like it's supposed to, and then going back through the doorway he came in and suddenly the player is at the Escape the Falling Castle section that comes right before the final boss of the game. Then you can fight the final boss as young Link instead of adult Link like you're supposed to. 
And you win. <laughs> oh, that's 1709. Wait, weren't you small when fighting Ganon? I guess the ending cutscene isn't affected by the glitch. This game truly was monumental for its time that it actually got a re-release on a platform that supported 3D capabilities. Nothing was changed because the people who would speedrun the games before it was popular on YouTube didn't want the changes. Though Miyamoto may understandably dread glitches in his games, other developers look at them more fondly. When Ocarina of Time was being remade in 3D, several of the game's developers wanted to leave in glitches and oversights from the N64 original. Ocarina of Time 3D's programming director Shun Moria said, one conflict arose when, as programmers, we wanted to get rid of bugs. But the staff members who had played the old game said bugs were fun. We were like, what? It wouldn't be fun if your friends couldn't say, do you know about this? So we left them in if they didn't cause any trouble and were beneficial. The fans had gotten into the gaming system they were empowered and joyed by and gave the power back to the disempowered studios who originally wanted to fix the issues. It comes to discussions of changes and decisions about what to put in the next iterations of games. Game design is usually part of the commentary the speedrunners give too. Whether it's positive, the story is just as simple and charming as you'd expect from a Mario game, the music is delightful as you'd want it to be, and god damn is this game a shining beacon of color that pierces through the fog of the all bleak, sepia toned action games. Or negative. You could argue the exact same point that if you explain too much, the game is bad. I think the game's just bad. Yeah, yeah, for a no, lot it, is. Of it is. For like most reasons. But using good game design, you can showcase the right path without explicitly saying it's the right path. Yeah, they didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm saying, if you put rings across the path, yeah. like that, that illustrates, hey, go this way. Speedrunning has changed the way people analyze games for more than just the surface. It directly shows how you can play a video game in an entirely different way from how the developers want you to play. Discovering the techniques and angles in order to beat them in multiple ways, and becoming more aware of what can happen so you prepare for familiar circumstances. Speedrunning can increase reaction time, spatial awareness, and problem-solving abilities, teaching players to push games to their limits. Encouraging this mindset will only increase the variety and originality of games we'll see in the future. The glitches and cheats and all the other features in the games are what keeps the speedrunners coming back. It's the one to discover something hidden in the game's code. It's the one to beat the clock on the leadership board. It's the one to be the fastest and therefore the best at the game. The studios make these games for the gamers after all, and the speedrunners are there to check their work.